Evening. My name is Raheem Thompson. I am the manager of public programs and special projects. On behalf of our CEO, Susan Abrams, board of directors, staff, and volunteers, I am honored to welcome each of you to tonight's program. The mission of the Illinois Holocaust Museum and Education Center is, ex is expressed in our founding principle. Remember the past, transform the future. The museum is dedicated to preserving the legacy of, of the Holocaust by honoring the memories of those who were lost and by teaching universal lessons that combat hatred, prejudice, and indifference. In tonight's program, Degrees of Separation, Working Towards Racial Justice in the U.S. and South Africa, we will learn about the fight for racial equality in the United States today and its parallels to the anti-apartheid movement in South Africa. We will be joined by presenters Roselle Prexy Nesbitt and Marissa Mormon, and their conversation will be moderated by Keisha Rembrandt. We would like to thank our community partners who were listed on the screen prior to the start of the program. Born on Chicago's West Side, Prexy Nesbitt has spent more than five decades as an educator, activist, and speaker on Africa, foreign, foreign policy, and racism. Over the course of his career, Prexy has made more than 100 trips to Africa, including trips taken in secret to South Africa. Prexy has less lectured and written widely both in the United States and abroad, publishing one book and articles in more than 25 international journals. He has also taught African history courses at Chicago Columbia College for 33 years. Marissa Mormon is a professor of African history and cinema and media studies at Indiana University Bloomington. Her research focuses on politics and culture in colonial and independent Angola. Mormon's work explores different media and how their uses, the practices and meanings people develop around them and their relationship to power shift over time. She has authored two books, Powerful Frequencies, Radio, State Power, and the Cold War in Angola 1931 to 2002. And in notations, a social history of music and nation in Luanda, Angola, 1945 to recent times. Our moderator this evening, Keisha Rimber, is an educator, facilitator, and assistant professor of teacher preparation at National Lewis University. She is a member of the Illinois Holocaust Museum's Education Advisory Committee and recently appointed by Governor Prisker to the Illinois Holocaust and Genocide Commission. We have hundreds of people attending the program tonight from around the nation even, and even the globe. We will have time for a short audience Q&A at the end of the program. We will do our best to get to, to as many questions as possible. Now let's welcome Prexy, Marissa, and Keisha. Thank you so much. I'm so excited to be in conversation with you both. And I think the best way to start is to hear about your stories and your interest in South Africa. When I heard Prexy, you've been there a hundred times. I wanna know about the first time. Um, so why don't we start with you and then we'll go to you, Marissa, to find, about, find out about your interest and your story. Well, thank you very much, Keisha. And thank you to all of the, your colleagues here at the Illinois Holocaust Museum and Education Center. My first involvement in, in, in Africa, uh, specifically around Southern Africa, was when, as an Antioch College student in 1965, I went to study at the University College of Dar es Salaam, Tanzania. I, it was a brand new university. I was probably the first international student they had ever had. And I was put in a room with a South African guy who had literally walked from South Africa all the way up to Tanzania to go to law school and university. I felt horrible because I arrived with all my goods and bags and all this stuff. and. My, my roommate, Lifford Singe, had, he had one little tiny handkerchief full of possessions because he had been walking. And he introduced me to other South Africans in Dar es Salaam who had, like him, 
come out to get training to go back into the country to make change. So that was the way I first met them. And we listened to show you how old it was. We listened to a Victrola, a, a record player that you had to wind up. And we listened to the 1963 speech of Nelson Mandela when he was sentenced in the, in the Ravonia trial. Yeah, that was the beginning. And Marissa, what about you? Praxi, I have so many questions regarding that story, but Marissa, <laughs> what, what, how does your, where does your story with uh, Africa begin? Uh, sure, thank you. Let me also just say thank you for this opportunity. And I'm so delighted to be here with two amazing scholar activists. Um, and thank you to the, the administrators and folks at the Illinois Holocaust Museum and Education Center for organizing this event. Um, so briefly, I would say I grew up in the suburbs of Chicago, um, very white suburbs of Chicago, um, but I grew up um, with an aunt who was an anti-racist activist. Um, and my parents would, were, I think, anti-racist in practice, but they definitely were not activists. Um, so I grew up very conscious of racism. Um, I'm super far more conscious of, of racial discrimination in the United States and racism than I was, for example, of gender discrimination, um, despite the fact that I was experiencing it all the time. And then um, I went to university in Washington, DC in the late 1980s and Reagan was in the White House. And there was a very active anti-apartheid student movement that had been going on for a while. And the year before I arrived at the campus, um, there, they had built shanty towns and you know, the shanty towns had been demolished by the administration and all of that. So those were all really important things that very specifically got South Africa on my map. I was interested in the history, I try, trying to understand the place where I grew up. Why were people so racist when they didn't even know, know anybody that looked any different from them? Um, where did that come from? And it was clear that that came from this larger history of the African continent and the United States and through the history of the transatlantic slave trade. And then sort of going to University in the late 1980s got me really interested very specifically in Southern Africa, where not only was there, you know, were there student anti-apartheid activists on US campuses, but the US was actively involved um, in supporting South Africa and in undermining um, newly independent countries in the region. So that was sort of the beginning of my interest. So well, both of you had the genesis was really in your youth, right? As students, you began to delve into this idea and this movement. And we know that young people uh, usually um, latch on to movements and provide energy for it, just like the civil rights movement here and the anti-apartheid movement in South Africa. Um, they're leading the way. And I'm thinking even specifically about Black Lives Matter today and the roads must fall movement in South Africa. Um, what, would, what would you say about young people's role in um, social justice and racial justice and what that's meant for the movement overall? Well, I think that one of the things that I would say is that they have been the motor. Young people have been the motor of change in both situations, both in South Africa and also in, in, uh, in, the, in the United States. Uh, I remember being uh, working in uh, uh, having just finished graduate school and hearing about the um, killing of Stephen Biko in 1977, and also about the Soweto uprising. The Soweto uprising of 76 was a moment where it was an amazing moment. It wasn't, it wasn't even the young people. Many of them were children. There were eight, 10, 12 year old children who were the motoring force of thousands of children protesting against, in the first instance, having to force to study in the language of the oppressor Afrikaans, but also in a bigger sense, just objecting to apartheid education in general. And then as the police responded brutally against them, shooting and killing so many of them, then the demonstration swelled and grew into a demonstration against the whole apartheid system altogether. And that was one of the beginnings. And of course, then in 77, the great hero they had 
Steve Biko, who got much of his energy from leaders in the United States. He was very, very moved by people who came from the Black Panther Party. He knew about Fred Hampton in Chicago. And that death also motivated many of these young people in South Africa to say, wait a minute, I'm prepared to go the whole route. I'm prepared to die to get change. What do you think, Marista? What, what's your take? Uh, I, would, I would agree with Prexy, yes, absolutely. Young people are often the motor um, of these movements. And also, I mean, if we, if we push back a little bit more in South Africa's history, I mean, Nelson Mandela, um, uh, got his start in the ANC Youth League, you know, with Oliver Tambo and, and Walter Susulu. Um, and they were, you know, they're the ones who turned it into a mass movement, but they also, this idea also of, of youth organizations are really important in, in many African countries. Um, and in the other liberation movements in the region of Southern Africa, young people were always critically, critically important. And the governments were also, when people came to power, the people that occupied positions in new administrations were often also very, very young. Um, and of course, today, you know, in the wake of the Arab Spring, we've seen many movements across the continent, across the African continent, and all of them um, driven by driven by youth. So I would also say, can I share some slides? Please do. Um, Please so do. I'm going to share some slides with you also to just, um, I'm a boring old historian. historian. Sure. Um, <laughs> so just to um, kind of push back our sense of this in time. Let's see, I can go back, oops, sorry. Just to push um, back our sense of kind of communications, I think, between South Africans and African Americans. It actually does have a much deeper history even than the um, civil rights movement. So I just wanted to point out a, a couple of things. And I think um, sometimes we forget that that sort of um, deeper history, but sometimes there is a consciousness of a, a transgenerational movement. Um, so this man is Yankee Wood. He was a former ship steward, as you can see here. He actually went and moved to South Africa. He first discovered South Africa um, as a sailor and went and settled in South Africa after the end of the U.S. Civil War. Um, and he was involved in, you know, the, the, the gold rush and the Fitzwaters Rand. He owned hotels and things like that. Um, and I actually learned about him from uh, a professor at Howard University, Bob Edgar, who had done a lot of research on early interactions between African Americans and South Africa in particular. Um, so there's a, there's a rich history of this. He's just one example, but shipping was obviously a really key way in which communication moved. And so not just individuals, but um, news of what was happening in the United States would happen. And people like Yankee would, would arrive with newspapers, with music sometimes. And we see there's a, you know, the, um, this kind of cross um, global really transatlantic forms of communication on ships that are carrying um, not just people, and, but their experiences and very often objects and news with them. Um, this is Sibusisiwe Violet Makanya, who was the first um, black social worker in South Africa. She actually studied in the US. She got a PhD in social work at Columbia University in 1930. Um, and whereas there were, you know, it wasn't uncommon, actually, there were numerous South Africans who studied in the US. Um, she was a particularly important figure. Um, I've got a quotation here, I won't read it to you, but it's from Robert Trent Vinson's really excellent book, The Americans Are Coming, Dreams of African American Liberation in Segregated South Africa, um, which is a book that's very much about the, um, the importance also of the Garveyite movement and the Pan-Africanist Back, Af Back to Africa movement. Um, in South Africa. Um, there was a man named uh, Wellington Buteleze who was a, a Garveyite. Um, but Violet Makanya was in incredibly important in South Africa. She was also um, fearless and bold in advocating for herself as a Black South African against the interest of white South Africans who were also in the US trying to direct Black South Africans into lesser programs than the one at Columbia, for example. And yet she was, you know, she advocated for herself um, and stood up against them um, and went back to South Africa to be a really important figure. Then there is Prexy Nesbitt. Um, 
speaking here in 1986 at an anti-apartheid rally at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, um, or Urbana-Champaign, sorry. Um, and at Prexy, you know, from the west side of Chicago um, to, to South Africa, right? And to Mozambique and other places. And he was, he's a really important figure. Um, he's a really important figure both in the US and both um, and in South Africa as well. Oops. Sorry, I'm not doing so well with the, um, the slides tonight. They're a little tricky on, on Zoom sometimes. So, and this is a photograph from what started out as the Roads Must Fall movement and turned into the Fees Must Fall movement in South Africa, 2015, 2016. Um, and as, you know, as we were saying, really advocating not just for student rights, um, what happened when Rhodes Must Fall, which was about taking down the statue of Cecil Rhodes at the University of Cape Town, turned into the fees must fall, it became a much more embracing movement. It worried, they concerned themselves with the rights of workers on campus. In other photographs, you can see signs that say, say don't outsource, right? Don't hire, you know, don't hire janitors from a janitorial company, employ pe people directly and pay them a living wage. Um, and so they began to embrace a larger set of concerns that related not just to student interests, but to broader interests in a democratic South Africa. So I will just stop sharing my screen there. I think that those points in that are very, very important. And the fees must fall forms a direct link with, with movements in this country by students around tuition and around the cost that students pay in this country. And I took a group of students over to South Africa about that same time. And it was just wonderful to see the interaction between these students, many of whom became leaders of Black Lives Matter, to see the interaction between these students and the students from South Africa. And there was just, just a kind of an, an alive dynamic that was going on. I also wanted to mention that in my own family, which we're, we're a West Side family, but there was at one point 17 Nesbitts teaching in Chicago schools. In my own family, the five brothers, my father and his brothers, they all delivered the Defender newspaper down in Champaign, Urbana, Illinois. And they had uncles themselves who were Garveyites. And so as they delivered the papers, they often would be talking with people all around about Marcus Garvey and about Africa. And I can't count for you the number of times that I heard my father say very sadly, I wish that your great uncle had had the chance to know that you would be so involved in Africa. He would have loved that because he was a, he, he, he worked um, fixing boilers for the police department on the south side of Chicago. And he also was part of a, a, a company called the Overton cosmetics company that was competing with another com cosmetics company. But my father and his brothers were also organizers. They were amongst the people who first formed unions for the red caps working in the railroad industry. So I, I think that one of the things I'm trying to say is that the parallels between these two situations of struggle were so deep so profound and went so deep and, and, and were so cementing to relationships. I think it's fascinating. I, I love, Marissa, that you brought us back even further than the civil rights movement and um, brought us to kind of that foundational of, of, of the transatlantic slave trade to develop that relationship. Um, because, I, you know, with this exhibit, Nelson Mandela is back in Chicago, which is this place that really loved and embraced him and really loved and embraced the movement to some extent. Um, Prexy was telling me about a, a WTTW documentary that, that, that I watched that was fascinating about um, Mandela talking in the 90s about Chicago being one of the most powerful anti-apartheid places, uh, movements in the country, if not the world. And so as we in Chicago fight this um, 
fight racial injustice here? What can we learn about building coalitions that go back so far um, in the fight for racial equality and freedom uh, in South Africa and in here right now, right here, right now? I think that one of the other things I would like to mention is that the ties can be very, very, it's very important we know the history. And one of the, two of the figures that were absolutely deeply involved in the cementing of relations between South Africa and the United States are W.E.B. Du Bois and Paul Robeson, absolutely deeply involved. The 1946 uh, uh, rally that they conducted at Madison Square Garden in support of the mine worker strike inside of South Africa was just a tremendous moment of solidarity. The other person is Paul is, is Martin Luther King. And King, before he got the Nobel Peace Prize, he stopped in London and he gave a speech there about the necessity to have economic sanctions against South Africa. Uh, his, his involvement with that was so profound. And it went just not to South Africa, but going into the parts of Southern Africa that Marissa knows much better, like Zimbabwe. King wanted to bring his nonviolent movement to Rhodesia. He, he talked to me about that when, I, I, I don't think your, your audience may know, King worked out of my family's church on the west side of Chicago, the Warren Avenue Church. So I had many times to get to talk to him about Southern Africa. Do you think that it, it? Do you think that Chicago became a place of influence because of things like uh, Fred Hammond, uh, um, uh, Fred Hampton, and because of the Defender, as you said, as these kind of beacons of of defiance? Well, I think that was part, but I, I think Marissa would agree with me that the other part was an economic. It was the numbers of Black people who came up out of the South and migrated to Chicago. And in a sense, Chicago was to the United States as South Africa was to the African continent. It was a motor, a place you came and you went and got jobs. And people really in South Africa gravitated to wanting to understand Chicago. I think I, um, I would underscore a couple of things that um, Prexy's pointed to. And one is the idea of solidarity and that these are political relationships. You know, it's not a relationship that's based on simply the history of the transatlantic slave trade and a sense of going home. It's literally, it's about a political relationship. It's about understanding um, racial discrimination in the context of um, white colonial settler society um, and about the experience of racism in an industrialized place. And in South Africa, you know, Johannesburg, um, and the mines in South Africa were, you know, industrialized mines and, and an experience of industrialization. Um, so that kind of experience of migration, experience of migration to work and to work in industry and the particular kinds of racism that one experienced in that process, um, I think, uh, point to some of the links between Chicago in particular and um, and South Africa and certainly a place like, like Johannesburg. And if we look at, you know, for example, films, I'm teaching a class on South African film right now. And so many films really focus on these things, like the literally what the space of the mine is like, right? All the symbols of the mines, the, um, you know, the big mechanical equipment that's used and the experience of that. It's really fundamental to particularly apartheid era South Africa. I think going right along with what uh, Marissa is talking about, I think there's a cultural, the music, South Africans love music, just like African Americans love music. And Ruth First, the renowned journalist who the South African regime actually assassinates her finally, she came to Chicago only one time did she ever come to the United States. She came to Chicago and her biggest desire was to hear blues in Chicago. She wanted to be able to go back and tell all the South Africans that she had heard the real blues. So I took her out to the, I can't remember that name of that blues place we had out in South Michigan Avenue, very famous that it closed up. But she got on that floor dancing with those blues and man, oh man, she had the time of her life. 
And this was one of the most committed and brilliant uh, women leaders of the African National Congress and of the South African Communist Party. Because as, as, as Marissa was talking about, these are very political struggles, very political. And, they, and they, there was a tremendous amount of assistance that was given to the uh, struggle in South Africa by the South African Communist Party, just as in the period of lynchings and all the things that went on in the South in this country, it was often the Communist Party that was the only force around that gave a lot of assistance to people in those early years. You, you all talked a lot about this, this idea of solidarity. What does present day solidarity look like? Well, I think that one of the things that we're seeing now is many young people, uh, including the people with Black Lives Matter, are beginning to get very involved with the health and wellness issues. South Africa is having a very difficult time with the COVID issue, very difficult. There's a variant that's there that they haven't been able to come up with good uh, uh, vaccination yet for. Um, they are trying very hard, but I think that that's only part of it. Or earlier with the HIV crisis they had in South Africa, there was great solidarity that was done then. I think also that the ongoing work of the anti-apartheid people, students who were all part of that movement, have also kept up an ongoing interest in the United States policies towards South Africa. And it, it, people were very disappointed, of course, in the Trump presidency, because he didn't even know where South Africa was. So it was a great, it has been a great relief. I think people are hoping to see great things come out of the Trump Harris, uh, Harris uh, uh, government that we now have. The kind of levels that we once had uh, when Obama was there. Marissa, would you want to? Uh, so I, I, well, I would just underscore, I think that um, this, what we see with, with people of Prexy's generation, you know, there's this kind of continued ongoing um, involvement as Prexy was saying that I think it's been incredibly important and that it's been, it works both at the level of kind of person to person, community to community, um, forms of solidarity, as well as trying to advocate as citizens at the level of policy, you know, state policy in, on the U.S. side for what can be done. And I, I think that's important. I mean, I think particularly now, because I think many people are, um, are cynical about the state and what the state might do, and for very good reason, but I think it's really important to, um, to also advocate at that level. Um, for internet, you know, for particular kinds of international policies. Americans are, I think Americans very typically are not very interested in the rest of the world, you know, sadly. Um, and I think that um, this is a moment when we could, we could turn that around, you know, and there have been these other moments in which people have done that. And they have done it from a, in a very grassroots bottom up sort of way. I mean, I think that's what part of what we can learn from the anti-apartheid movement in the US and other places in the world is that it was a very grassroots movement, you know, and there were organizations um, throughout Europe um, in other places in the world, in Vietnam, on the African continent. Um, and th again, they, these were really grassroots based movements and it shows us the ways in which just average people can really make a difference. And these were international movements too. Keisha, there were uh, the meetings of the anti-apartheid movement, the global anti-apartheid movement were some of the most extraordinary experiences that I ever had because there'd be 40, 50 different countries that would be present. And these were people who all came together who shared the fact that they were working from behalf of, at that point, freeing Nelson Mandela that they were working on behalf of ending the apartheid regime. I think that this was uh, an early taste. It was kind of a little mini UN at many of those meetings mm -hmm. that we had that were so full of people from all over the world. And I think also, and I would just say this, Keisha, I think many people who did anti-apartheid work 
were like the people who did civil rights work and anti-Vietnam War work. It's a particular kind of movement and they went from doing that work on into other things that had to do with me doing social change, doing serious social change and making for a better world in general. I think we're seeing, uh, I don't know, did you, would you agree? I think we're seeing that same type of international camaraderie through the Black Lives, Move, Black, Black Lives Movement. I saw this summer just when, you know, my heart swelled when you see Paris and you see um, people in New Zealand and you see people across the world speaking up and speaking out um, about that. Absolutely. And in South Africa too. Yeah, I think in, and, and what we saw, in fact, in some places on the African continent was people taking up the mantle and saying, um, our lives matter too, Black lives ma on the African continent matter, and using that as a way to advocate for their own rights against their own now independent governments, um, which in many cases, or in some cases, um, certainly not in all, are not um, serving the people that they're meant to serve. And I think one of the greatest traits that, you know, I, I got many times to be around Mandela, like I was able to be around Harold Washington, you know, and one of the traits that Mandela had that was part of what made him a great leader in my estimation was he cared about everybody. He cared about the smallest child that came to see him. I was there in Harare, Zimbabwe when he came and made the visit there. And as the meeting had ended, he was coming out with his whole entourage and he saw a group of children and some of the children were crying and Melandela stopped his people and he said he went to the child and said why are you crying and the child said we didn't get to dance for you we were supposed to dance for you mm -hmm. Melandela turned around and he said to his aides bring the people back fill that stadium back up and it took an hour and a half to get people grounded back up but he had them come back into the stadium so that the children could dance. See, that's the essence of humanity, right? That human that's dignity that, is, that, that you strive for and that when you lose it, you fight for it in all respects. You are talking about the, the political implications and, and even like legislative implications. We have seen here in the United States just how fragile and prized democracy is. And uh, South Africa knows that as well. There are so many legislative things going on here in the United States that show us uh, that fragility. How is true democ democracy realized, do you think, in America as well as in South Africa? Because I would say we're still on the journey to it. Uh, um, well, I would say, I think, you know, what I, to point back to what I was just saying before, I think it's all these really small scale things, you know, um, I think the local is so, so important um, in making these things happen and people need to be able to be involved locally. They need to be able to advocate for things locally. Um, and I think one of the greatest forces um, or fighting against and slowing down democracy in the United States is capitalism, <laughs> you know, the form of capitalism that we're living with now. And I have been extremely heartened to see a strong critique of that um, among the youth movements today. I mean, I think that is a part of BLM, it's a part of the abolitionist movement. Um, and I think that's critically important because, you know, my, fa my father was a small business owner. It's really hard to be a small business owner anymore. You know, he was really driven out by big, big box stores, right? Um, radio, which is something I work on, radio, local radio stations are, are disappearing in some ways, you know, the, the co commercial scene has been bought up by a few big um, corporate uh, radio producers. And the same is true with newspapers. The Chicago Tribune was just, you know, purchased by a big company, right? And so it's, that's very difficult. I think those are really key things. And we don't necessarily notice those things going on, but they have a major, major impact on daily life. So I think democracy is something that it has to be very, very local and, and has to involve all of us. You know, I think in the United States, we get very lulled into, um, oh, we just want things to, for example, during the Trump regime, we just want things to go back to normal. Why can't things just be normal? 
that's true. I mean, I'm, I was tired of, you know, constantly checking the news every five minutes because you just didn't know what was going to happen next. But there is, um, we need to be more engaged. We need to look outside ourselves and look into our communities. And I've also been heartened by, you know, since the pandemic, the kind of massive resurgence of mutual aid organizations. Um, and, you know, it's not easy work. I'm involved in one in my neighborhood, not, you know, not as much as I could be, um, but I, you know, they're struggling, but it's, I think that is a really important thing. This idea that, okay, we can help ourselves. We can improve our own lives. Um, and we can also insist on accountability from our, our leaders. And I think another thing that I've always been struck with is the difference between Southern Africa and the United States is that people care for each other on a personal level and direct level much more. And one of the things that always marks a great leader for me is that leader who knows people's names. The, they know people's names, they know their background. The, the great Emilcar Cabral, who was one of the leaders that one of the, the names that most Americans have never heard of, but was probably one of the greatest leaders along with Mandela and others, like Samora Michelle, but Grasa Michelle, you know, man, Grasa Michelle was a woman who was married both to Samora Michelle and married to Nelson Mandela. Now, that's an incredible woman because of that in itself. But the thing that they all have is this capacity to reach the smallest of people, to every person matters. I remember being at dinner in Mandela's house, and my two sons, they were five and six, we'd finished dinner and they wanted to be closer to Mandela. So they got up on both sides of him and Mandela turned to him and he said, well, now, Jelly, that's one of my sons. What do you, what do you want to be when you grow up? He didn't say much and he turned to Samora. Well, Samora, what do you want to be? And Samora didn't, he just got shy. Then, then all of a sudden, Jelly said to Mandela, I want to be the king of Africa. Mandela didn't crack a smile. He said, well, Jelly, that's a rough one, but we'll work on it. You know, this is, this, I said, well, you know, here, this is one of the, arguably the greatest known leader that the 20th century ever saw, had taking the time to seriously deal with a little person. You know, those, that's a mark of leadership. Yeah, that's an incredible story. I just, his, his humility always struck me. Uh, just uh, as great as he was, it, it was almost if um, he didn't understand uh, the impact that he had on all of us. Um, what do you think we can learn um, from, from South Africa and their movement? What do we take from it? From it here as Americans? I think one of the things that we can take is uh, it's a very difficult lesson for us, I think, especially in the current times, is a clarity about who the enemy is. Are we fighting individual white people or are we fighting systemic racism, the institutions of systemic racism? I, I have said the other day to a group of people in a meeting out here where they were talking about these uh, proud boys attacking, possibly attacking the campus that I'm at, Chapman University here in Southern California, the proud boys were gonna come on there. And I said, well, you know, let's, let's get ready. Yes, and they shouldn't attack us, but we also gotta remember that they are, they are reachable, that you can reach those people. And then many of them do what they do out of a situation of ultimate fear that they are scared to death in this society, a society in which normal makes people very afraid to live, just normal. And that, I, that's why I don't, I don't use the phrase, let's go back to normal. We don't want to go back to normal. I think that that's, that's we've got to see that getting getting rid of individual white people or getting attacking them is not going to be what we need. We need to re, uh, reintegrate. Re, it, 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 same thing with 
with the way in which men relate to women in this country. It's just horrifically sad, the violence that men have. And we've got to re-educate people fundamentally. And I think that's one of the things. Now, they haven't done well on that question in South Africa, believe me. That's a huge problem. But they, many of them admit it and are also willing to work with other countries who are trying to do the same thing. And I think we have to reach out much more to get with other countries and do things in conjunction with other. We shouldn't be acting like we're the ones that have the answers for the world. On the contrary, this COVID thing has proved that this, this place is just a big old bubble ready to fall apart. I would um, say also that the idea of American exceptionalism, um, whether it's activists or whether it's the state in general and how Americans and American chauvinism, um, I think that is a huge um, barrier and that the more that we can work against that. And I think one thing we can learn from South Africa to that end is that, um, there, you know, that is a country where there was a white minority rule. Um, they tried, they have tried, they continue to try to deal with their past, and yet they still are um, among the most, if not the most, unequal society in the world, you know, haves and have nots. Um, and that has to do with the, you know, literally the, the, the structure of the, the apartheid state, which was only formed in 1948, which really isn't that long ago, right? In terms of historical time, it's just not that long ago. It also takes a long time to undo. And I think the fact that they learned that um, they have not resolved the land issue and the land issue is older than 1948, but it's clearly fundamental um, to creating greater equity in South Africa. Um, and I think the US has to deal seriously with the question of reparations. And I think we need to deal also with what they attempted to do in South Africa and that was the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. It was, and it was not easy. It was not easy. And we, we, I think if we attempt it here, it isn't gonna be easy here either. But to- Do you mind just telling folk what that is? Who might yeah, not. that was the process that was started in 1990, where if you, if you told the total truth about what you had done for the apartheid regime, you could be given forgiveness, but you had to tell the entire truth. Because if you didn't tell the whole truth, then you could be brought up and charged in a court of law. Now, some who did bad, bad things did do that, but there were some who didn't do it and some who did lie. And the general attitude of many of the whites, not all of them, but many of them was, they called it Bishop Tutu's because Bishop Tutu presided over all the sessions, the great Nobel Peace Prize uh, winner. They called it Bishop Tutu Circus, and they didn't like the fact that it interfered with their regular television watching. Incidentally, they loved to watch Dallas coming from the United States, the white South Africans. But it it was a it it was one of it was one of the successful. There have been about twenty of these truth and reconciliation processes around the world, but it, 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 it had some real weaknesses to it. But I kept looking at it and wondering, can we do that in the United States? Could we attempt to do that as part of the healing that we have to do in this country? And it, it would not be easy. It would not be easy. And I think that if we tied that up with reparations, that would be an awful big challenge in this country. But I think it should be, because I think it's very important yeah. that we get white people to understand this is as much their history as it is our history. Black history doesn't just belong to black people. It belongs to all the people in the United States. And I, I think that the issues of the past have uh, affected us all. If I think about, absolutely. If I think about Heather McGee's new book, *The Sum of Us*, um, that talks about that the harm isn't just with um, black people or people of color. It racism has harmed this entire country and cost this entire country. Absolutely.
Absolutely. Yeah, the TRC is an interesting model. Um, it, it went on for a long time. And the idea, I mean, just to be a little, uh, say a couple more things about what the exchange, what amnesty was. Amnesty was extended to people who could make the claim that they also um, committed crimes, not for personal reasons, but for political reasons, right? So they, either they were ordered to do so, um, or they did so for political ends, that they weren't, you know, it wasn't revenge, it wasn't personal revenge or something like that. The idea that it was, you know, political crimes that had been committed, um, those people, if they came and gave the full truth, could be, um, could receive amnesty. But the truth of the matter is, and this is one of the shortcomings that, that Prexy was pointing to, is that in fact, all the big fish got away. Um, you had a lot of the, you know, sort of mid-level police, mid-level intelligence folks who came and gave testimony and uh, who suffer from P PTSD from the horrible, violent, uh, appalling brutality, um, death and murder that they, torture and death and murder that they inflicted um, on their fellow South Africans while the people who were giving the orders for that um, got away. I mean, Frederick de Klerk, who negotiated with Mandela, also won the Nobel Peace Prize, but he refused to go to the TRC. Um, so some of the most, you know, the most important figures, the people that were making decisions, um, the people that were in charge got off scot-free and it was, you know, the people who were executing the orders who got, um, you know, who endured, um, the, the reconciliation process and, and the after effects of that. And in many cases, you know, people lost their families, you know, white cops who, whose families didn't know what they were doing um, when, when their families learned that in fact, they went off to block class every day to kill people, didn't want to have anything to do with them. You know, they'd been lied to for many years. So it's, it's a very, very complicated um, and harrowing process, but it was also based on the idea of creating a public record um, and creating an archive of what had happened because so much of the documentation had been either things had not been recorded or had been actively disappeared. Um, and so that was a really important um, product actually of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission was creating this, um, this record, this historical archive of the things that had happened. And so many people who had, you know, their children or loved ones who had been disappeared during apartheid um, and they had no, they didn't know what had happened to them. And, and these were opportunities for that, as well as for, you know, reconciliation and for dealing with those questions of, of how, and how do you create reconciliation? What are reparations? Reparations was a part of the TRC. It was probably one of the less successful parts of the TRC. Um, so that's also an important lesson. And along with Marissa's point that the big fish got away, one of those that I was most personally disappointed in was that they never raised at all the question of the big international transnational corporations mm. that made invested so much in maintaining apartheid and made so many profits out of the system of apartheid so that the big for instance banks some of whom I, I would I could name them for the rest of the night but I won't do I'll be nice to them tonight they they didn't pay, have to pay a fine. They didn't have to help contribute to the, the, the little paltry sum that they gave to so many of the victims. And they should be held accountable for the role that they played in sustaining the apartheid system. Horrible roles. And they, South Africa became a nuclear power, for instance. And those countries that contributed to making the apartheid system be a nuclear power should have to pay a price for having done that. And I'm talking about specifically Great Britain, I'm talking about the United States, I'm talking about West Germany, I'm talking right. about Israel. These were the countries that made apartheid South Africa a nuclear power. And one of the biggest fears we had throughout that period was that the apartheid regime would just drop little miniature nuclear bombs on the nearby capital cities of Africa. So it becomes so important to share the true story and to preserve the true memory, which is what um, the TRC was hoping to do. Thank you all for that amazing conversation. Um, yeah, sorry to interrupt. 
Um, this was a great conversation, but we also have some really great questions that I want to get to as well, if you all are ready for that. Sure. All right. Um, one of the first questions we got was, could you speak to the importance of the female activists and a part of this movement? Because a lot of times the males get mentioned more often than the females, but we know they play a great part in this as well. Could you highlight some of the the female activists that caught your attention and some of their great work? Well, go ahead. You go first. In South, in, in South Africa in particular. Um, yes, well, uh, South, South Africa or Chicago. Um, so I can speak to South Africa. So Prexy mentioned Ruth first. Um, and also I wanted to pick up this thread earlier about sort of culture and politics. Um, a, a key figure and a key international figure and one who came to the United States was of course, Miriam Makeba, the uh, fantastic, Chanteuse, but she was also an anti-apartheid activist. Um, there were numerous other women in South Africa and outside of South Africa, and certainly lots of people in the anti-apartheid struggle who I'm sure Prexy can, can talk about in, in greater detail. Um, but, uh, you know, Fatima Mir, um, uh, the Black Sash was, was a white women's movement, anti-apartheid movement that worked on, for example, shaming parliament. They would show up in parliament and they would be completely silent and wear black sashes over their dresses. Um, there was, um, gosh, so many, Prixie. Uh, Winnie Mandela, of course. I mean, I think part of, the, um, part of Mandela's legacy, sadly, um, was to move away from his relationship with Winnie, Winnie Mandela. And I would say in the last mm, 10 years or so, I think there's been an attempt to really recuperate and show us how important, what an important figure in, and political activist Winnie Mandela was in her own right. Like Viol Violet Macanya also started, Winnie Mandela started out as a social worker, but she was incredibly important both in South, Af South Africa and outside of it in her own right, not just because she was Mandela's wife, but because she was involved in the struggle and particularly in the struggle um, after 1976. And so for youth figures, she was a really important, important icon and activist. I think of also people like Ma Sisulu. She was just extraordinary. She's the heart of the United Democratic Front. She was the heart. Older woman that was a, uh, trained as a nurse. She was never just the wife of Walter Sisulu, who was one of the most important figures in the struggle. Ma Sisulu was the heart of a movement, of a coalition that had over a thousand organizations in it. Then I think of somebody like Ruth Mompati. Ruth Mompati came out of South Africa with Mandela and Tambo. She had been working in the law office. She then becomes the representative in London of the African National Congress. I'm thinking of a wonderful woman whose name is escaping me right now, who gets killed, who was the African National Congress representative to, uh, to France and Switzerland. She gets killed because she gets she 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 tells the story of France's involvement with nuclear arms and providing support to the South African nuclear industry, and she's shot to death. So there is, and and then there are all these just ordinary women. Or when you when 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 mobilizations took place in South Africa, there were thousands of women who would be the heart of that mobilization. So I, when you have, there's an expression, when you have struck a woman, you have struck a rock. And that's what they were. They were the rock of the movement. There's actually a great um, documentary by that name made in the 1980s, um, subversively in South Africa about the role of women in the movement. All right, um, we're gonna get to the next question. In Chicago specifically, where have you seen the greatest change and improvement? And in your opinion, what do you think we need to have the most improvement at? Like, where do we? Where is there still room for growth? And what do you suggest? I, I would like to just take that very quickly. And one of those that I would say the greatest growth has to be with regard to low wage workers in Chicago. There has to be the total unionization of lower wage workers 
there has to be the city, even if we don't get federal $15 minimum wage, we get it for all low wage workers and all tax and unionization, not just better wages, but also the full and complete right to unionize. There has to be an end to this pattern of gentrification that is pushing poor people out of the city. We were very scared on the west side that we're gonna lose large parts of the west side because of this displacement patterns that go on all over with the rich taking the homes and pushing people out altogether. I think that there has to be much deeper probing of the police department links to organized crime. I don't believe for a minute that the violence and shootings we've seen in Chicago are rooted in black people or Latino people or Mexican people. It's rooted in the systematic marketing of arms that has in turn a linkage to the policing structures of the city. There's no question about that in my mind. I grew up right next to the Sears police station where they were interrogating people. And I, I, I still believe that there's still bodies that are buried up in that old Sears uh, structure because of how deep was this, the criminal element that exists still within the police department of the city of Chicago. Are there any Chicago activists today that you think we should know about that you admire? Well, I would say that I, the unending list of people in Black Lives Matter that we don't know, the unending list of people doing regular unionizing work, that there are people that uh, in all kinds of organizations that are involved in in, in taking up international issues that we should know about. Uh, I think about, uh, for example, in South Africa, they all think automatically of the Palestinians. I think of my Palestinian friends in this city. I think of those who, in, from the Jewish community in particular, I would hope there's much more solidarity to reach out. I, it's un, unfathomable, unfathomable to me that Israel could right now be giving out medic, medic, uh, vaccinations to everybody but to the Palestinians. How can you do that? How can you just ignore an entire population? It's unfathomable. All right, um, last question. Um, what do you and Marissa plan on collaborating in the future? And could you share if you have collaborated in the past, any other things? Let's tell them about the mercenaries, Marissa. And <laughs> Go ahead, Bertsy. <laughs> We're working on uh, trying to tell a story of mercenaries, trained people who then for money intervened in different situations and were instrumental in killing people and maintaining the the oppression and the horror of those situations. And some of them were tried, some weren't, but that's a big pattern still going on. I can't remember the name of the organization that exists now. And he was married to Betsy DeVos, this guy that runs this Derek organization. Blackwater. Blackwater. They've been renamed, but. They're renamed, yeah but they have played a horrible role on the African continent. And that's one that I'd like to, we're, we're doing some work on that. We're sort of looking at the prehistory of it, a very specific case of 13 mercenaries, British and American who are tried in Angola in 1976, and also um, the key role of African American um, lawyers in that case um, that were advocating for helping to the Angolan state to put these mercenaries on trial. One of whom came from Chicago, Kermit Coleman, who was part of the Illinois, of the Chicago American Civil Liberties Union. And he went and observed at that trial. All right, um, that's it for us. We're out of time for tonight. But I wanna thank you all for joining us this evening. 
Please take time to fill out the survey that's left in the chat. Your feedback is greatly important to us. Um, please look out for further upcoming programs accessible through the events page linked in the chat as well. And I wanna thank Prexy, Marissa, and Keisha uh, one more time. Thank you. Well, we are, I wanna thank both of you and I know uh, Marissa will wanna say something too, but it was just great to have this opportunity. You all are welcome to come out and spend time with me out at Chapman University in California. Anytime the snow and the ice gets to be too much here, come on out to California. I want to go to Africa with you, Praxi. Anytime, anytime. <laughs> Thank you so much to everybody and to everybody that um, signed in to, to listen to us chatting tonight. And thank you so much, Keisha and Raheem, Megan, Matthew, and Praxi. Yes. Thank you. Thank you as always, Marissa. Thank you all.